Hey there, Fanny Rob here with my friend Jess. Jess is drunk, and these are conversations with Jess. Today's episode, we're going to be drinking North Coast Brewing's Rasputin, old Rasputin, not new Rasputin. Probst. Probst. I'd like to talk about role playing games. In my opinion, the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons is the best edition of Dungeons and Dragons to date. Well, guess what? I agree completely. And I'll explain why. My introduction to the role playing games, and well, I, not my introduction to role playing games, because that was actually Marvel Superheroes, which I didn't understand what the fuck a role playing game was. I thought it was Choose Your Own Adventure, and I had no clue what was going on. But eventually I got introduced to Dungeons and Dragons, and a little introductory set, which led into second edition, which is a complete mess, as you probably well know. Every single thing you do in second edition Dungeons and Dragons has a different mechanic. Fist fighting is completely different than fighting with a sword in second edition. So, third edition comes about, it does a lot to kind of streamline the game. Fourth edition comes about, it sucks. Fifth edition comes about, and they nail it. Everything's perfect. The skill system is intuitive, but you have that whole proficiency bonus where you don't have to worry about the bookkeeping. The classes are all you know, interesting, do their own thing, but are mostly balanced. The, just everything is firing on all cylinders. I completely agree that 5th edition is the best edition of Dungeons & Dragons that I've played. i played a little bit of the old school edition, which is completely bananas. Um, it's simultaneously complex and incomprehensible. You're talking about Thacko? Oh yeah, well, you know, I grew up with Thacko. That, me and Thacko go way back. You also grew up with uh, communicable diseases that don't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. Times have changed. Get armor class zero. In the old days, the lower your armor class, the better. If you had leather armor and no other bonuses, your armor class was 17. And so you had to roll and see where your hit combines with 17 on the back of to see if you hit it or not. And the lower the better. The, and starting in third edition, they had the brilliant thought of like, wait a minute, why don't we just make armor class the number you needed to hit? Well, in his defense, they're, they're, they're adapting basically war games to this, this form of entertainment that doesn't exist yet. You're taking war games and saying, hey, wait, Maybe instead of like handling platoons of different troops, you control one guy. And they're using that same war game system, which made sense in the war game, to controlling one guy. That's the guy running around. Yeah, you're gonna have some, you know, some, some speed bumps there, because they don't translate exactly well. As role-playing games have developed over time, they've, they've made it better and, you know, make more sense, but I won't I won't hold it against them for the, the old days being kind of rough and ready because they were inventing it wholesale. True. So I won't hold that against them, but but yeah, they go never made any sense. Like if if you have a system where you're rolling it a D twenty to see if you hit, why not make the armor class what you need to hit? Or do what a lot of role playing games do and just have armor deduct the amount of damage you do. Pre second edition, what would you give uh, on a scale of one to great D and D at that point? Well, and I realize it's a subjective scale. It's a subjective scale. On the one hand, I would actually probably rank old school D and D higher than second edition, to be honest, because there's less moving components that make no sense. Because what second edition is is they take you have the original old school D and D. And over time, they added this expansion and this expansion and this expansion with all different rule sets. And in second edition, they basically take all those additional rule sets and just pile them on to the original one. So they have a bunch of different rules that don't line up at all. And that's what second edition was. So old school, I would actually give it a higher ranking. I'll say that it's a good three out of five. You can take old school D&D and you can give it to relatively new players and say, this is how it works. And they can have a fun time. And granted, if you want to play a dwarf, you're playing the dwarf. You're not, you can't be a dwarf cleric or anything like that. You're just the dwarf. But 
you don't have as much options, but yeah, you're going to be able to get the game. You're going to have a fun time with playing the game. All right, so then uh, let's skip over the second edition right. for, for a second. What would you give the third edition of D&D on a scale of one to great? I I didn't do the right scale for some. I, I gave a number. We know, we know what you meant. Okay. All right, so third edition, I will give props to because I think it... And said, okay, we're going to look at second edition, we're going to make a unifying mechanic for this. Virtually everything we do is a d20. Here we go, d20, add the appropriate modifiers, and look for a target number depending on how difficult it is. Okay, now, now we're talking. we got one mechanic to do virtually everything we do in this game. So it's easy on the players. But I think d20, third edition got a little bit overboard with classes and prestige classes and feats and skills and all that i think it was kind of victim of its own success in a degree because it just get, went it went crazy overboard um i felt as though it was a little bit more complex than it than i wanted out of yes my game. it didn't need to be complex and i I like to streamline things, but then it streamlined things, and then it said, okay, well, we streamlined the main mechanics, and so now let's go completely ape shit with skills and feats and class abilities and all this. Um, so I would I would rank it maybe maybe a 3.5. I don't know. Um, you think it's better than first? Edition? I don't know. I don't know. Now I'm thinking about it. I think the complexity is a turnoff for new players. Pretty much, you could you could get like school children and get them to play in first edition D and don't think you could with third edition. I think third edition would be too complex. Um, do you rank it high, again? Do, do, I, do, two point nine. I want I rank it like a tenth of a point under first edition. Like I would probably play third edition before first edition. Like my, as myself as someone who's been playing role playing games since he was like ten years old. Right. But. As a whole, especially if you're introducing new players, I, I, I'm a big proponent of keep it simple, stupid. So uh, I would might rank first edition higher. All right, and now let's talk about fourth edition. Oh, fourth edition was a heartbreaker for me because I bought the fourth edition player's handbook, like the true nerd I am, like like right out right out of the gate. Go oh boy, new Dungeons and Dragons, and I'm reading it. And I'm like, oh, this looks so good. It, it you know. It streamlines the skill system that was so complex in third edition. Oh, look at these interesting powers for each class. Oh, that, that's kind of cool. You know, yeah. And on paper, I felt like I would love this game. And then I actually played a campaign of fourth edition, and then the the scales fell off, and I became sad because it is basically playing a computer role playing game like the MMO. Where you have to do all the math yourself. And it is horrible. All the classes pretty much play the same. Like, because you all have these powers. And you can use, like, certain powers you can use at will. And certain powers you can use once per encounter. And certain powers you can use once per day. Sure, that's fine from a balancing perspective. But it means your fighter doesn't feel that much different from your wizard. Because they have, you know, the certain powers they can use so often. So, like, like the wizard, the whole thing in old school D and D, you're so you're more frail than the fighter, but you have these cool magic spells, but you're limited on them, and you have to decide when it's important to use this sleep spell or when you can use this fireball spell. Or, and in fourth edition, got rid of that where everyone feels kind of the same, and it just I kinda, absolutely agree with that. A lot of people re refer to Pathfinder as Mathfinder. Is Pathfinder based on 4th edition D&D? No, Pathfinder is based off 3rd edition D&D. It's basically 3rd edition D&D, but goes even further down the rabbit hole of, like, granular, detail-oriented, you know, you know math, math hammer. And... If that's your if that's your thing, if you love that level of detail, then by all means go for it. I'm not trying to like disparage anybody for playing, you know, the role playing games that I, they like to play. For me, that's not for me. Let's go back to fourth edition. What what would you rank it on a scale of one to great? 
Uh, it's such a heartbreaker for me because, like, the other thing before the edition is playing it in practice. We found it. We found out that um, attacking doesn't scale the armor class. So you end up with, like, even if you have these cool abilities, you end up whipping with them more often than not. So you don't even get to use your cool abilities, really. So I'm going to have to put it at, like, a one or a two. All right. I would literally rather play, I, I can't think of a fantasy, R, fantasy RPG I, I wouldn't rather play in the fourth edition. Fair enough. All right, now let's get to fifth edition. You've talked a bit about yes. uh, the fact that it is your favorite. Um, what would you say is the main thing about 5th edition that has us agreeing that it's the best edition? Well, I think it, it, it strikes a perfect balance. Like, it's easy to understand. You have a proficiency bonus. Any skill you have, you're going to add the same bonus to that skill. So if you're proficient in Arcana, or if you're proficient in Drew and persuasion or whatever, whatever your little proficiency bonus is, you're going to add that number to your roll. So it's, it's, it's pretty simple, but at the same time, characters have so much different areas to, to go forward. Like my fighter might look completely different from your fighter. Like maybe my fighter is a fencer who's like super dexterous and uses all these like finesse and feints and all this stuff. And your fighter is a a big, like, bulky, um, brawler type that just overpowers people. Both, both fighters are completely viable. Both of them can completely work in a party, but they both work in diff different ways. And I love that it gives you that flexibility while being accessible. Like, couldn't agree more. One of the things about when I first started playing when I was a teenager, um, it was mostly second edition mm -hmm. uh, that we were playing. And what what I loved about that edition was it seemed like when I wasn't playing the game, I was thinking about what my character might be doing. Yeah. My character might have gone off on this adventure and accumulated all this cool stuff. Now he's back home, animal husbanding. Yeah. Whatever it was that he was doing, it's like I was thinking about it when I wasn't playing. Fourth edition... I basically only played third edition on computer games. Yeah. I, I rediscovered D&D &D for real when the fourth edition came out, mostly because of the episode of Community. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great episode. Right, that kind of got us thinking, hmm, wouldn't the kids like to play that game? Sure. So anyway, that's when I got back into it. And the, the thing that was missing from the fourth edition for me was the, the whole... It was much more mechanical, and everybody, I agree, kind of felt the same. Yeah. The wizard could jump into battle and and hit in melee combat as well as a ranger. Yeah, and the, and the fighter still had spells. They right. were just called, you know, just, you know, perilous attack or whatever. They exactly. Did, but they did the same thing. The fifth edition to me captures the the feeling that the second edition gave me. Which is that my character is is exists outside of the pages on this book. Mm -hmm. My character is somewhere else, even when I'm not playing the game. I like the fact that I can I want to think about what my character would be doing, um, but at the same time, it it takes the rule set from the second edition, and the third, and the fourth, and Pathfinder, because there's no doubt D and D knows Pathfinder exists, yeah. <laughs> and and sort of took the best of those and made the fifth edition with the idea that we're gonna make this the best of, of the things that worked. We're not, gonna, we're not going to overcompensate for something yes, that yes. was perceived to be bad and this thing, we're gonna make this the best, almost unapologetically and not with any fear of people saying, man, this thing sucks. They trimmed the fat, but they kept the options open. All right. D&D isn't my favorite role-playing game. The 5th edition is my favorite D&D edition. All right, so to end this conversation, mm -hmm. which I hope there'll be many more conversations. Me too. On a scale of 1 to great, where do you put 5th edition? Pretty damn great, honestly. I, I feel like it's accessible. I feel like it has stuff to do for hardcore fans. I... 
I feel like it's got something for everyone, so I'll, I'll declare it a great role-playing game. I can't disagree. Cheers. You did he make it to be Old Rasputin? I thought they killed his ass. Alright, let's see here. Old Rasputin develops a cult following wherever it goes. Gotcha. It warms your gut. Let's see. Because it's like 10%. It's right up there. I think it's just under 10. I'm fill that up a little bit more for you oh, and for me. I'd like you to are a generous pourer. That is what I do.